Thank you, Lee. Reading taken from Sam, chapter 16, verses from 9 to 11. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with the joy in your presence, with the eternal pleasures at your right hand. Amen. Book of Acts, chapter 2, verses from 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man greeted by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said, to, said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to do this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of, the, resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. He exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. Thank you. Are we on? Yep. There we go. Wow. Resurrection. We're going to be looking at Jesus, which is always good to do in church, and to look at this glorious resurrection and how it was fulfilled uh, in the psalm scripture that we had read earlier. Um, but I'm just going to go off script a little bit now. As I was walking to the church, um, I just want to read some verses um, to encourage you. We're going to be looking at resurrection today. And often we hear about Christ's resurrection. We celebrate Easter Sunday but we don't always talk about our resurrection and the resurrection of loved ones that have gone before, faithful people of God that have died in the past. God promises one day these people will be raised to immortality in glorious bodies. And it's like two bookends. You have one bookend and you have the other and I was thinking how, if you know the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, it says that God formed Adam from the dust of the earth and blew into him the spirit of life. 
And there's going to come a day at the end of time where this creative miracle is going to be done on a greater and grander scale. And I love that. And just as God breathed life into Adam by coming close to him, so it shows that our God is personal and he will bring life to so many in the future through the miracle of the resurrection. Revelate, before we go to the psalm reading, Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You know, in the, the New Testament, the word for resurrection is the Greek word anastasis, which literally means a standing up again. A standing up again. Or to stand out of a chair, to stand up. What a beautiful picture of the resurrection, to stand up again. And this is where I'm going off script there's people in this church who are suffering. There are people in this church who have suffered. You've lost faithful people of God in your family. They've died. One day, these people will stand up again, and you will be reunited with those precious loved ones. And you know, many of you have made sacrifices in your life that other people don't know. You've sacrificed for your children, You've sacrificed by serving your parents, even in their old age. You've sacrificed your freedoms to be a blessing to other people. God wants to say to you today, there is going to come a day when there will be a standing up. And you will be rewarded for all the faithful service you've done. Even the service people have never seen, never noticed. God is going to put all things right. There's going to be a recreation a resurrection, a standing up again. And you know, many people don't understand God's purposes. They feel frustrated. They feel worn down. They feel rejected. They feel betrayed. It doesn't make sense. And some people, they don't understand Christianity. It doesn't make sense. Many years ago, um, Samantha and myself, we went to watch a Shakespeare play. Now, I'll be honest, Shakespeare doesn't interest me at all. But I am interested in my wife, and I wanted to please her. So we went to this Shakespeare play, and it went on and on for hours. And then it came to an end. Everybody got up, and they went their separate ways. And we got up, and we went back home. And I said to Samantha, that play made absolutely no sense. We found out the next day we'd actually gone out during the interval. And people were actually getting up to go for a coffee break. We never saw the end of the play. And that's why it didn't make sense. But the Bible gives us, like a bookend, the beginning and how it's all going to end. And I want you to know that whatever sacrifices you've made, whatever struggles you've gone through, whatever struggles you are going through now, you will stand up and it will all make sense. Now I'll start my sermon. <laughs> um, could we have um, Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11 on the screen? And just sellotape it on there. I'm going to be quoting, you know me, we're going to be going all around the Bible now, and you'll never catch up with the Bible text. But we will come to that, I promise. Um, Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11. And I'll just read that again. So these are the words of David. So it says, Therefore my heart is glad, 
and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets up to preach, and he quotes that psalm and uses it in reference to Jesus, that Jesus, this resurrection from the dead, is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Psalm 16. So the theme of my talk today is it's time to get excited. We should get excited about the resurrection of Jesus. And I want to talk not only about the resurrection of Jesus, but how it impacts us. It was good news for Jesus. It's good news for us. It's time to get excited. And you know, the Bible says a lot about resurrection in the Old Testament. So in Job Chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Job says, I know my Redeemer lives and that in the end, remember the book ends, the end of time. I know that my Redeemer lives and in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. How my heart yearns within me. The contemporary English version says, I long for that moment. Wow. Job was longing for that moment where in the flesh he see his redeemer. In the ERV it says, I will see God and I cannot tell you how excited that makes me feel. Do you get excited about this concept of resurrection in the future? That you will see your creator, that you will see your maker? I want you to get excited. Psalm 71, verse 20. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. That's resurrection. Wow. I love it. Isaiah 26. Again, more reference to resurrection. Isaiah 26, verses 19 through 20. Your dead shall live. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. The earth will give birth to the dead. Whoa, resurrection. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, chapter 12, talking about the last times in verse 2 and 3. And multitudes, I love that, not a few, multitudes of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then the resurrection spoken about in the New Testament scriptures. Acts 24, verse 15. There will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. It says there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice, hear the voice of Jesus, and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. And Paul says, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 2, verse 6 and 7, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. I want to talk about the resurrection, and I want to say to you, do not fear. Do not fear death. God is on your side. You may be facing cancer. You may be facing another issue. You may have total paralyzing fear about maybe death will come to you soon. Do not fear. God is in control. So why, why did Peter refer to Psalm 16, verse 9 through 11, as a reference to Jesus, because 
If you read the entire psalm, it doesn't say Jesus, and it doesn't say Messiah. And I remember when I was at Bible school, I went to these lectures on what's called hermeneutics. And so the lecturer told us, you know, when you do a sermon, you need to make sure that you're, you're quoting the Bible in context. You need to look at the verses above, the verses below. You need to know the historical context. You need to know who it was written to and why. Uh, great lecture. So at coffee break, I said to this hermeneutics lecturer, I said, do you know the Bible writers would have benefited so much from your lectures? <laughs> because so often, if you look in the New Testament of prophecy being mentioned, fulfilled from something in the Old Testament, if you go to the Old Testament writings, it's not always that clear. Now, is this a contradiction? Now, the Bible doesn't have contradictions, but it does have complementary statements. That's, that's why I say, okay. So why did Peter, in Acts chapter 2, quote Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11, as a fulfillment of a prophecy that Jesus had fulfilled? Well, I want to bring some suggestions to you. One, Jesus was a pioneer and a pattern of what was mentioned in these scriptures. And what I mean by a pioneer and a pattern, I used to work with a guy who um, used to work in the army. Now, the way they do things in the army is very different. They have a lot of electronic stuff now. But in his day, his job was he would be parachuted behind enemy lines. He would be a pioneer going into enemy territory, and his job was to make maps. So they would make maps of trails, pathways, installations, targets, uh, and then come back, reveal the information, and then it would equip people to go out into that territory and to win the battles. Jesus was a pioneer. Jesus was the one in Psalm 16, verse 9, 11. He is the one who entered into this enemy valley called death. And he came out on the other side. And he actually made a pathway for you and I to have everlasting life. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, 18, we read about this pioneer, Jesus. Jesus said, to John, behold, I was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. And I'll just read that in context. So verses 17 and 18 of Revelation chapter 1. John says, when I saw him, that is Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he, Jesus, placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead. But now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death. So this is one reason why Peter quotes this psalm being fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus was a pioneer. He went to death. He came victorious out of death. And he has set the pattern that we are to follow. And Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Paul picks up on this. And it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren and sisters. Jesus, the firstborn, he has set the pattern, and we are to follow in his steps. As Jesus was raised from death, so we shall be raised from death. I love that. A second reason why Peter quotes from Psalms. You know, Jesus was, a, not only was Jesus a savior, he was a great Bible teacher. And he knew the Bible better than any hermeneutics lecturer that I know. And in John chapter 5, verse 39, 39, Jesus, talking to the people, said these, that is the Old Testament scriptures, 
These are the scriptures that testify about me. So Jesus is in the whole Old Testament. He's there if you go looking. In Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 45, Jesus is speaking to his people. He said, this is what I told you. So Jesus is speaking after his resurrection. He's giving them a Bible study. He says, this, this is what I told you whilst I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then it says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Jesus is in the Old Testament. Wow. The Amplified Classic Bible says, then he thoroughly opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. Wow. The best Bible teacher you could meet is Jesus himself. A third reason why Peter may have quoted Psalm 16 as a fulfillment of Jesus is for another reason, that God's Spirit teaches us what is true and illuminates Scripture. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit was poured out, and, Jesus, and, and Peter got up to preach. But the Spirit of truth this Holy Spirit of God would have guided Peter into sharing the truth. Now, what I'm going to share with you now, I'll let it go up on YouTube, but don't tell anybody outside of this church. I used to be a secret agent. I used to be in the secret service. You didn't know that. You didn't know that, did you, Heather? Ah, it's amazing. So I was a spy. And like uh, a lot of nine-year-olds... I was a secret agent. I used to get a comic called Warlord, and I became um, a, a Peter Flint um, secret agent. And I used to wear disguises, and it always makes me laugh, looking back, how my parents took me seriously. But I used to be a little nine-year-old wearing false beards and clothes, making me look like an old man, and I'd have a walking stick. And in my book, it was a disguise, and they, they must have laughed at me. But I really thought I was a secret agent. And I had these code books so you could like learn different codes and stuff like that. And me, my brother, and my cousin Mark, we were part of ECTO. And ECTO was the Earl's Common Defense Organization. So Earl's Common was an area where my aunt lived. And we, f we thought we were secret agent agents guarding the territory. Now, why do I tell you this story? Well, as a secret agent, part of me, I used invisible ink for secret documents. And the invisible ink was lemon juice, a bit of water, and you mix it up. And then you use a matchstick, and then you can use it to write on a piece of paper. And then when it dries, you can't see the invisible ink. But when you apply heat to it, and I'm not sure how I managed to do this without parental help anyway, a, a candle or stick it in the oven, as soon as the paper begins to get warm, the actual lemon juice goes brown. So the invisible writing becomes visible. Now, why did I tell you about me being a secret agent? Have you ever found that as you read the Bible, suddenly a passage leaps out of the page? Something you've read before time and time again, and yet something comes alive in this book. And it's like the invisible ink has been made warm, and suddenly it's visible. And God makes Scripture come alive. And it could be that Peter was reading the Psalms or reciting the Psalms, whatever he was doing, and the Holy Spirit of God, like the heat applied to the lemon juice, made it visible, tangible, and real. So that's another reason why Peter may have quoted this psalm. Jesus himself said, the scriptures testify of me, even the psalms. Wow, what a God. So how do we make it practical? How does this impact our lives? 
We hear about the resurrection, the resurrection of the truth, uh, the resurrection of truth, that God will one day work this amazing miracle of recreation. But how is it relevant to you and me? And how does it affect you and me? Well, the first thing is, we need to get connected with God. Do you remember the passages talked about a resurrection to life and a resurrection to condemnation? Um, so we need to be in the right resurrection. We need to be connected with God. So if we don't know Christ, we need to connect with him. And it's like hoovering your house and you don't plug the hoover in to the power socket. You're just pushing it around, but there's no connection. Jesus is our connection with life. We need to be plugged in him to have this glorious resurrection of life in the future. In 1 John 5, verse 11 through 12, we read, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. So to benefit this resurrection of life, we need to be plugged into the power. We need to be connected with Jesus. We need to say yes to God and no to sin. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 55, verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardoned. So we need to be connected with God to experience that life in the future. The second thing we need to learn, we need to learn from the iceberg, don't we, Heather? We need to learn from the iceberg. Now, here's an interesting fact for you, and I like interesting facts. Icebergs, they can travel at a massive one mile an hour. Okay, but they can drift, and they may be drifting north at one mile an hour, okay? But there's a wind coming towards them, a very strong wind, so that the, the iceberg's drifting north, but actually the wind is heading south, pushing against the iceberg, and yet the iceberg is still traveling north. How can that be? Ask me. Thanks, Graham. You've been paying attention. Well, an iceberg isn't just what you see at the top of the iceberg. They say 90, about 80, 90% 90 of an iceberg is under the water that is not visible to somebody who's just looking at the top of the iceberg. And underneath that iceberg are currents. And those currents are what powerfully are taking and drawing the iceberg. So although the wind is on the surface, the iceberg is traveling because of the currents taken in a particular direction. Now, why do I use the illustration of the iceberg? Do you remember the passage we read in John chapter 28, verse 29? Jesus said, all those will come out of the grave, and he says, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those that haven't done good to a resurrection of condemnation. Well, that sounds, sounds like works. And did you read that passage? Remember, I'll read it out to you again in Romans chapter 2. Had Paul not attended lectures on uh, hermeneutics? Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Sounds like works to me. I thought we were saved by faith. I thought we were saved by grace. Has the Bible got it wrong? No. Remember the iceberg. It looks like it's drifting in one direction, even though the wind's supposedly trying to move it in another one. But it's the currents that keep it on the direction that it's on. And you know, in our Christian walk, we are called to a life of good works. We're called to a life of holiness, of truth. Yet the power doesn't come from us. 
just like the iceberg, is not moved around by the winds, but it's taken by the current. So God has given us a power in our lives to live a holy life. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27, God says, I will give you a new heart. So this is the current. We're the icebergs, but we're driven by the current of God. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The voice translation of verse 27 says, And I will put my spirit within you and inspire you to live by my statutes and follow my laws. When we're connected to Christ, God inspires us. Wow. The love that he's shown for us. The way he's been faithful to us. The way he provides for us. Our God, our creator is incredible. And he inspires us to do good. God, I want to serve you. I want to obey you. Psalm 40 verse 8. I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. That current that's moving, taking hold of the iceberg, is God's spirit in the believer's life. Another thing that we can learn is have confidence in your iPad. Have confidence in your iPad. What's that mean? Graham, you'd be pleased to know I do actually use technology. Although I have a notebook, I love my notebooks, I do have an iPad. And a few years ago, the battery was crazy. So one minute it said 75 on the battery thing, and then you, you just make a coffee and come back, and it's 7. And it's like, I think there's a problem here. I'll just put it in the charger, and within the seconds, it's 100%. And you know there's something wrong with the battery, okay? So I took some good advice from my brother, and he said, you're going to have to get a new iPad. But you can keep it r running by using a hairdryer. I don't know if you know this. It yeah, careful so you don't blow up your iPad, but if the battery's not working and it's not charging properly, using a hairdryer just for a minute at the back of the iPad, the, the battery, you must take the cover off so it doesn't melt, but it actually warms up the battery enough to give it a charge, and it does work, but there comes a point where you've really got to get a new iPad. And do you know what? Have you heard of iCloud? I don't understand iCloud. So here I am with a dead iPad, and I'm thinking, but all my photographs are on there. All my documents, everything I've written, my emails, everything's it's dead. I can't access it. And there's this thing called iCloud. So I buy a, a new uh, Apple iPad, and I'm setting it up and stuff. And then it comes to this magic moment where you download this thing, stuff, from iCloud. Where is iCloud? Is it in Hawaii? Is it in Jamaica? Is it a satellite? I have no idea wh what this iCloud is. But I just press these buttons, and suddenly, the photographs all appear on my new iPad. The documents are all downloading. It's like, whoa, all the stuff that I was worried about, it's back on my iPad. And I just thought, the miracle of the resurrection in the future. How does God take dust, recreate, and somehow put us back into it? And I thought, if we can do it with an iPad, how God can download us again in our new, resurrected, glorious bodies. And I want to say again, don't fear God. If an Apple iPad can download all the information that was on it, so God knows you better than any iPad. Everything in your character, all your, the richness of who you are, God's going to download you again in a glorious, recreated new body. And that is good news. Jesus, the pioneer, the one who went into enemy territory, went through death, and came back victorious, he has laid the pathway for each one of us 
If you're not connected with Jesus, connect with him because he's better than any hoover plugged into the wall. Knowing Christ, connected with the source of life, is everything for us. And do not fear death. God is in control. And you don't need to worry about the good works. Jesus said that he's putting a power within you to achieve the works he's called you to do. And the last thing that I would say, tell other people about the good news of Jesus. Has anybody told you you can get <laughs> 30 Gospels of John from Pocket Testament League UK free of charge every month? Go for it. Tell people about Jesus. It's the great, stupendous news that the world needs to hear. And I say these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.